Hello, everyone, and welcome to another webinar offered by Discovered Universe. My name is Julie. I'm the director of the program, and I'll be very happy to introduce our guest speaker in a second. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone who's online with us. And if you're watching the recording, well, welcome to you too as well. I know the timing is not great for everyone, so I'm happy to provide the recording so you can watch it afterwards. For those of you who are with us, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. It's kind of interesting to see we have people in many different cities across Canada and even in Hawaii. That's uh, pretty neat. Um, if you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to put them in the chat. That's where we'll be interacting with you and we'll have a, a question period at the end with our speaker. Um, so I don't think there's anything else I need to say. For some reason, I kind of have a blank there, but um, I'm happy to introduce our speaker. Hello, Nathalie. Hello. If you don't know Nathalie, she's been actually, uh, well, I collaborate with her a lot and she was one of our regular guest speaker uh, during our Astro at Home series, which we did almost two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. But Nathalie is the outreach scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope in Canada. She actually has many different jobs, uh, so I'll let her introduce herself in more details. Uh, but she's a fantastic speaker and I hope you'll enjoy her talk, giving you the details about the James Webb Space Telescope, which is an amazing achievement for human ingenuity and a, an instrument that will bring us amazing details uh, about the universe. So there you go, Nathalie. All right, perfect. Well, thanks so much for having me, Judy. And uh, thank you for, for attending today. I see a lot of familiar names in um, the attendees list as well. I see Kim and Kevin from Kingston who uh, are part of, of RASC in Kingston. And uh, I did lots and lots of outreach with them when I was doing my master's and my PhD in Kingston at Queen's University. So it's nice to see them there. So I'll go ahead and share my screen with my sound shared. And I'll just ask for confirmation that you can see my screen. Yes, I'll go. Okay. Perfect. All right, so um, Julie gave a brief introduction for myself. Uh, I, wear, I wear many hats, uh, but I'll mention just two today. So I'm the coordinator at the Institute for Research on Exoplanets at the University of Montreal. Uh, it's based at the University of Montreal, but we have members across many different institutions in Quebec, the province of Quebec. And I am also the outreach scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope in Canada. So I don't work for the CSA, I work with the CSA uh, and also a lot of colleagues at NASA and abroad um, Space Telescope Science Institute, the European Space Agency. I'll talk a little bit about all these different things. So I know these talks are often targeted towards teachers, K-12 teachers or CGEP teachers who are interested in bringing astronomy into their classroom. And so I will mention throughout the presentation a few different curriculum links that you could be you might be able to do um, with these topics to sort of incorporate them in the like provincially approved teaching program kind of thing. All right, so the first thing I always meant, like to mention when I'm talking about astronomy is that it's often considered the oldest science. So we've been doing this for millennia essentially. And one of the reasons is because you don't need a whole lot to do astronomy. You need a beautiful night sky. Um, and you need your eyes a lot of the time. And so we've been able to look at the sky, look at how the stars and the planets are changing their positions in the sky, looking at things up here like comets uh, in the sky and uh, taking notes essentially. But over time, humans have been able to develop instruments to improve their study of space and astronomy turning into astrophysics, understanding the physical um, behavior of these different celestial bodies. So the first telescopes that were invented weren't actually invented to do astronomy. They were invented in the 17th century, early in the 17th century uh, in Europe. And they were used to look towards the horizon, looking at on oncoming ships essentially. But it didn't take very long for someone to take this tool and point it upwards. So Galileo was one of the first people who took the telescope instrument and pointed it towards the sky just about a year after it was first invented by Hans Lippershey in 1608. And he saw many things through his telescope, including very famously Jupiter and its moons. So we know that Jupiter is a planet that we can see with the naked eye, but with a telescope, you can see much higher resolution, you can see a bigger picture, you can actually see some gas bands, some detail there. Um, and uh, you can see moons that are orbiting around Jupiter. So Jupiter has many, many moons, but it has four very large moons called the Galilean moons now. And 
night after night, he actually saw the different positions of these moons showing that these moons are actually orbiting the planet Jupiter and not planet Earth. So this put into question, um, and others did the same thing, such as Copernicus, the whole idea that everything was revolving around the Earth. So using telescopes, we could really cement this fact that not everything revolved around the Earth. So here, if you are um, in a high school teacher, a link that you can make quite easily when you're talking about telescopes and their use in astronomy is if you're doing optics labs, uh, where you're doing playing with lenses and mirrors and everything. So there are two main types of telescope. Refractor telescopes, which use lenses. So these are clear pieces of glass that are shaped uh, in different ways in order to focus the light, but the light passes through these lenses or reflector telescopes that use mirrors. So the light there is bouncing back and forth throughout the tube of the telescope. And for very long, the main type of telescope that was used was a refractor telescope. You could just use a lens essentially. But in order to um, improve the, the capabilities of the telescope here, because the light is only going in one direction with a refractor telescope with only lenses, people had to make absurdly long refractor telescopes. So this is a diagram here, a drawing of such a telescope. So uh, probably a, a, a rich lord or sir or whatnot who uh, had um, many people working for him and they're all helping him out with his absurdly long refractor telescope. But if you have a reflector telescope, because you are allowing the light to bounce back and forth within your tube, you can actually make it much more compact. So the great majority of modern telescopes use mirrors. So they're reflector telescopes, not refractor telescopes. Although there are still many reflector telescopes out there, including some that are professionally used. So lots of different sizes of telescopes that are in use. Many of you have telescopes at home, I'm sure, and they can be quite small. And with these small telescopes, if you are you know how to use them, you are in the right conditions, you can actually see a fair amount of stuff. They can be quite small. And usually when we talk about the size of a telescope, we're talking about the size of its opening, which is sort of equivalent to the size of its lenses or its mirrors. So it's called its aperture essentially. So you can go from a few centimeters of aperture or you can go to meters and meters wide in aperture. So very, very large telescopes that are professionally used. But this is just a, a range of these different telescopes. Um, one that's sort of medium size that we have here in Quebec is called the Observatoire du Mont Mégantic, uh, which is co-owned by University of Montreal and University of Laval in Quebec City. And so lots of people here use it in Quebec. There's one in um, Hawaii on Mauna Kea called the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, used by many Canadians as, as well, with uh, almost four meter wide mirror. And uh, where we're going to larger telescope, we have the very large telescope down here, which is in Chile, which I've had the, the pleasure of using. And in terms of mirrored telescopes, we can go to about 10 meters right now. Although we are building much larger telescopes right now on the order of 30 or 40 meters wide. So this is sort of like what's coming up next in the, the next decade or so. So a lot of these professional telescopes are very expensive. We're talking millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So if we want to um, use these telescopes, these expensive telescopes to so their full capacity, we have to place them in the right conditions. So these are a few examples of the correct conditions, the conditions you have to consider when deciding which site to build your telescope at. So the first thing is you wanna be away from light pollution. So all the light that you have in cities from buildings and street lamps and cars, that is going, if it's not well directed downwards, it can shine up into the sky and cause a sort of background haze. It's like noise pollution, but for light essentially. And everything that's dimmer than that light pollution becomes invisible. So here in this image, you have an example of the same area. I think this is in London. Um, and uh, it's uh, before and after uh, a power outage or before and during a power outage. So when you take away all of the city lights, you can actually see the Milky Way. So this is very important. You wanna be away from the city. Ideally, you wanna have very dry air with very little clouds, no precipitations. If you're doing certain types of other astronomy, like radio astronomy, that this becomes less important. But if you're using sort of mirrors that are looking at visible light, this is important because those clouds are blocking out the light. So someplace dry, like the desert. 
And another point, you want to be at a high altitude. And that's not because you want to be closer to the stars, because the altitude that you gain, the distance that you gain towards the stars is quite insignificant compared to the total distance we have to these, these stars. But the air is thinner at that altitude. And the air acts sort of like a fluid. It's sort of like trying to see a rock at the bottom of a moving, moving stream. And if the stream is moving very vigorously, the image you're going to capture is quite blurry. So this is something we call atmospheric seeing. And you can see here a star and an image of craters on the moon. And you see that it's sort of distorted because the air is acting like a fluid and jostling around the light particles that the, the telescope is trying to capture. So if you build high up on mountaintops where the air is thinner, it doesn't uh, create so much of this distortion, which, what we call atmospheric seeing. And so this is what you want. You want to be high up, away from city lights in a dry place. Um, another thing I can mention, you can do astronomy at lots of different types of light. So again, if you're doing high school, this is something that's a great connection with the electromagnetic spectrum, where you can talk about how we look at different parts of the spectrum through astronomy. So a lot of people are familiar with visible light. Most of our telescopes that we use, especially the telescopes at home that we use, look at this kind of light. But that is just one type of light with a certain type of energy or wavelength in an entire spectrum that goes from very energetic types of light, like gamma rays or X-rays, the medium sort of energy, which is ultraviolet visible. And then as you go to longer wavelengths, we go into infrared light and even radio waves. So humans have evolved to be able to look around in visible light. And part of that reason is because many stars, such as our sun, shine most brightly in the visible spectrum. So they shine in lots of different lights, but the peak of their light is in the visible spectrum. So over time, most living creatures on Earth, their eye and their eyesight has evolved to take advantage of that, essentially. So we could imagine there are other problems with the scenario but we could imagine if we were orbiting a sun that was very very bright say in the x-ray maybe we would have x-ray vision instead as i mentioned there are other issues with that but essentially we can thank our um the sun for the way that we see the light around us um and we want to study all kinds of light in the universe, because even though we only see invisible light, the universe shines in lots of different types of light. So this is a galaxy, the same galaxy that we can see in different types of light, the whirlpool galaxy in the radio light, infrared, optical or visible wavelengths, ultraviolet and x-rays. And depending on the type of light you're looking at, you're looking at different parts of that galaxy or different phenomena that are happening in that galaxy. So certain stars will peak in the visible light, certain cold stars will be brighter in the infrared, gas will tend to be um, more visible in the, the x-ray, dust will be visible in the far infrared, so lots of different things that you want to look at. But one good and bad news kind of situation that we have here is that we live on Earth in a protective atmosphere. This is really good because a lot of the lights that I mentioned that shine around in the universe like gamma rays and x-rays and even ultraviolet are actually quite harmful to humans. This is why we put on our sunscreen in the summer to protect ourselves from the ultraviolet. Luckily, the atmosphere protects us from that. Otherwise, it would be potentially very hard to, uh, to uh, stay alive, essentially. But the downside to that is if we want to look at phenomena that are shining at these types of light, we have to get out of this atmosphere. So this diagram here shows at which kinds of light the atmosphere is blocking it out. So here you have everything that's sort of more energetic than violet. So ultraviolet x-rays, gamma rays, it's being blocked out. Good for our health. Not so good for astronomy, but it's a fair trade off. We'll take it. Visible light has a nice window, which is, again, one of the reasons why humans have adapted to use visible light so much. Infrared, a lot of it is blocked out. And then there's a nice big window in the radio waves, again, which is one of the reasons why we have developed our telecommunication around radio waves. So what do we do? Because we are interested in looking at all these different types of light. Well. Let's go to space. Space has all these problems solved in terms of finding the right conditions to look at all different types of light in space. 
So you're far from city lights. There's no clouds, no precipitation. There's no atmosphere to cause that blurring that we had before. And there's no atmosphere to block out the light either. So NASA, for many decades now, and other countries as well, have been developing telescopes to be put up into orbit and look at all these different types of light. So over the last few decades, they've had great observatories that look at different types of light. So Compton, which was looking at gamma rays, Spitzer, which retired a few years ago, looking at infrared, Chandra, which is miraculously still going. It's like the energizer buddy of, of um, telescopes because uh, X-rays can be very finicky, uh, but it's still working. And then you have Hubble, which is also a very impressive telescope. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Hubble right now. So when I talk about space telescopes, people usually think of Hubble first. So Hubble was launched quite a while ago in 1990. And since then, it has made incredible discoveries in terms of science, but also has changed the public perception of astronomy quite a bit. There are now, you can't walk outside without seeing like someone well, with a NASA t-shirt or like a, a dress or a sweater with like an, a Hubble print on it or a backpack. They're used so often everywhere, these Hubble prints. It's, it's very impressive. And it's been going on, as I mentioned, for a long time. So Hubble is an optical telescope, a visible light telescope. It's sort of like a big human eyeball. And it is in low Earth orbit, just about 540 kilometers above our heads. And thank God, because when it started, it had some issues. There's some issues with its, with its mirrors, which caused its first images to be quite blurry. So because it was in low Earth orbit, we were able to send astronauts in 1993 to fix it with the Canadarm. And it had a pair of glasses, more or less, put on. And since then, it's been taking really breathtaking images. But we unfortunately can't put all telescopes at that orbit. So this is something that we can't rely on for the rest of our lives. So as I mentioned, uh, it's been going on for over 30 years now, 32 years uh, this April. Uh, and uh, we're at the point now after six, um, six uh, not rescue missions, but repair missions and upgrade missions, that NASA has not decided to renew its uh, commitment to fix it anymore. So right now we're hoping nothing goes wrong with Hubble. It continues working, but because the technology is getting a little bit older and we are no longer planning on repairing it if something goes wrong, we need to think ahead. And ahead is basically now, um, finally, the, the successor to Hubble. And we say successor because hopefully the missions will overlap is the James Webb Space Telescope. And the mission is starting right now, basically, as we speak. So it's super, super exciting. So the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which will be the main focus of my, my webinar today, is an international collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, both of which were partners for the Hubble Space Telescope, and the Canadian Space Agency, which was not formally part of Hubble. So that is very, very exciting. As a Canadian astronomer, as a Canadian person, I'm very excited. And I really hope that this just sort of sets the groundwork to have more of these international collaborations with important Canadian components. So very, very exciting. So my role in the mission is to be the outreach scientist for the mission in Canada. So what does that mean? So I can tell you a little bit about my background and you can ask me more questions at the end if you're interested. So I am an astrophysicist. Um, my background uh, is actually researching the formation and evolution of galaxies. I'm part of the scientific team, but my, my main goal, my main role in that team is to act as a bridge between the scientific team and the general public. So I make sure to spread the good news. I create content online for print. I do interviews. I do public talks. When we start getting science in, I'm going to be working on press releases just to make sure that everyone in Canada and across the, the globe really appreciates all the incredible science that is essentially paid by taxpayer dollars. So that, that is the important thing that uh, I get to do and I'm very excited. I've had this role since 2018. So before the launch, I was preparing everyone for the launch and now finally we can get to the science this year. Very exciting. So this picture here was taken uh, in 2019 during a partners meeting. And uh, this was the last laboratory where Webb was being tested in California at Northrop Grumman. So I was very fortunate to be able to see it 
with my eyes. It is very big, I can tell you that. Um, but um, one picture that I think showcases my dedication to the mission even more is this picture here, which is my Halloween costume from last year, uh, 2021, where I built not a to scale bottle, obviously. It's like one to 15, essentially, scale um, model costume of the James Webb Space Telescope. I didn't go trick or treating, but I did pass out candy, and a lot of kids knew what I was, which I was very happy about. So um, if you've heard a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope in the news in the past few months or years, you know that it's been in the works for a few decades. And for the last decade or so, really the key thing that's been happening is testing. And one of the reasons is because we will not, or we are, we have not, I have to like change the tense of my verbs now that we've launched it. We have not placed the James Webb Space Telescope in low earth orbit where we can fix it just like we did for Hubble. It's going to be placed, or it is placed very, very far away from the Earth at 1.5 million kilometers away. So testing, very, very important to make sure that nothing was gonna be broken during the launch and nothing is going to break during the scientific operations. All those tests were finalized last summer and it was packed up to be shipped um, on a boat. So at the end of September, it was put onto a truck near near Los Angeles and then there was a police escort that escorted it down in the middle of the night uh, to the port and then it was loaded on to a boat where it was then shipped off to Karoo in French Guiana in South America going through the Panama Canal over the course of about two weeks. This was a very very exciting peculiar hard to believe kind of mission because one of our concerns when shipping this thing on a boat were pirates because this is about an $11 billion machine and we don't have a backup for it. So it's like even more than its monetary value, there was like a lot of value to it. And we were concerned that pirates were going to try and take hold of the telescope and ask for a ransom for it. So six different ships were launched at the same time and different, uh, different configurations and different trajectories. And very, very few people knew which boat actually carried Webb until it was finally in Karoo. So there was like a little bit of like a almost action thriller movie aspect to this. But very luckily, it arrived in one piece, safe and sound in Karoo uh, at the spaceport. And um, it was it began its, its unpacking and its preparation for launch. So one of the things that needed to be incorporated in the design for web, very, very difficult. And one of the, the first time that we've done something this complex is we needed this to fit into a very small space. The space is actually not that, that small. The, the, the rocket that is sent, sent it up into space is called an Ariane 5. It's one of the contributions of the European Space Agency through Ariane Espace. And it's one of the biggest rocket fairings that we have, but this telescope is really big. So it needed to be built such that it could be folded up on itself like a piece of origami. And so it was sort of perched up on the top of this rocket and then the fairing sort of was lowered onto it and clasped like that. Um, this happened over the course of a few months in October and December, and then it was fueled up in, in, in December and uh, yeah, to be finally launched. And uh, so, in we were supposed to launch like December 17 and then December 18th and then December 23rd. In the end, it ended up launching December 25th on Christmas Day. So it's like hard to plan something out so perfectly, but we didn't plan it, plan it out that way. There were some weather issues. It just ended up like that. So before being launched, it was rolled out. So you can see it here and uh, yeah, it's a really massive rocket essentially. And it's going to be pushed out of its little house to the launch platform. And this is a very, very slow maneuver. It's essentially going like three kilometers an hour. So you can like walk alongside it on its journey there. And uh, yeah, you can see the logos of the three collaborating agencies on it, NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency. And uh, yeah, even though it's Christmas time, it's the tropical jungle very close to the equator. Uh, and uh, yeah, very excited to see this being moved out. So we uh, in Canada and all over the world, we were, of course, we've been waiting for this for years and years. And we were hoping to be at all kinds of different places to celebrate this, but 
This was like right when the Omicron wave of the COVID pandemic was getting started. And many of us had to cancel our trip. So I was supposed to be in Baltimore, Maryland, um, where the um, mission control is for, for the science operations of the telescope. I had to cancel that trip. Lots of my colleagues had to cancel their trips. But we had three Canadians down in Karoo to represent us. Very, very happy about that. So this is René Doyon, who is the principal investigator for the Canadian contribution to the web mission. He's also the director of the Institute where I work and a professor at the University of Montreal. And uh, he's been working on this essentially for 20 years. So he really wanted to see his, his, his uh, instrument and his telescope go up into space. This is Begonia Vila. She was working at Honeywell, which is an industrial company in Canada. Uh, they're the main industrial partner who worked on the Canadian contribution. And after the Canadian instrument was delivered to NASA in 2012, she got scooped up by NASA to be a flight systems engineer. And so she, she was there to actually um, look at, do a lot of the prep work for, for the launch. And uh, she was there for the launch. And then this is Dave Aldridge, who was one of the key engineers working at Honeywell. He's still with Honeywell and uh, he's been working on this for many, many years as well. So we're finally there, it's, it's launch time. I barely slept that night. Uh, a lot of people were, were watching this from all over the world. So if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna allow us to relive this moment together. Cinq, quatre, trois, deux, unité, top. And we have engine start. And lift off. Décollage. Décollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. So I've gotten to the point where I no longer cry when I see this video, but I still get chills, but I've, I've seen it quite a few times now. Um, but my, my partner, so I, I had to watch it from home with my family and my partner wanted to commemorate the, the moment. And so he set up his, his um, phone, his iPhone with a tripod to sort of look at our reaction while this was happening. So if you wanna know what I felt in that moment, this is essentially me. Um, as I was watching the launch with my Kleenex box all, all tucked in, I'm wearing my, my red web polo like the people in the, the picture previously. And uh, yeah, it was a really, really emotional moment for all of us. But we didn't have to worry because the whole thing went perfectly. The trajectory was perfect. Uh, yeah, it went off without a hitch, essentially. We couldn't have asked for better. So we were very, very happy. And one of the last things, one of the really, really nice surprises, we found out essentially that... Um, so there are many different stages to the rocket that are is launching Webb into space. And the last piece that detaches from space had a camera on it. So that camera could actually look at the Webb Web Space Telescope as it detached from the Ariane rocket booster. So this is our last look. This is the last time that human eyes can essentially look at Webb and it looks like a glittering diamond in the sky and you can see the earth and its curvature in the background there. Uh, it was a really beautiful moment. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a surprise for a lot of the people. They didn't know that this was going to be on pl plan for the mission. And uh, I can just advance just a little bit. Here you see the solar panel that is protruding out of the Webb telescope. That is one of the first things that needed to happen to make sure that the mission is successful because there was only about an hour's worth of power on the, the telescope um, for it to finally start using solar power and, and working. And so this happened right on time. And uh, yeah, basically we had to say goodbye to Webb at this point in time, but we knew that it was gonna, it was gonna go well. And uh, we had planned for this mission for a long, long time. And uh, yeah, it was a really, really emotional moment for us. 
So that is launch. That's what, that's what happened during launch, but it doesn't stop there. It is a very complicated mission because of what needs to happen next, which is what we call deployment. So I mentioned that the telescope is sort of tucked away like a piece of origami. Um, what it needs to do then is start opening up like a flower, blooming like a flower. And this doesn't happen while it's static next to the earth. It needs to keep the propulsion that it got the boost that it got from the rocket, from the Ariane 5 rocket. So it's unfolding as, it, as, as it's moving towards its final destination, which is a point called L2 or Lagrange 2. And I'll, I'll explain what that is in a moment. Um, and so you can see in the lower, lower left corner here, its position compared to the moon. So while the deployments are happening on the screen, it's also moving. So it needs to open up lots of different things. So the solar panel, very, very key. And then it opened up its um, communications array so that we could talk to it. And then one really key thing about the Webb telescope is its sun shield. This was really, really nerve wracking. Uh, this was something that was extensively tested and it had to be redone a few times because we had a few, few issues with the testing of the sun shield. It is a huge sun shield, five layers, the size of a tennis court about. Uh, each layer is made out of a material called Kapton and it's very, very reflective. When you take all five layers together, it's the equivalent of about an SPF cream of 1 million. So it blocks out the great majority of sunlight. And that's because we have a hot side and a cold side to the telescope. The cold side being the mirror and the instruments, and they need to stay very, very cold because of the type of light that the telescope looks at. So just the sun shield itself had about 130 mechanisms and springs and bits and bobs it needed to unleash. Uh, and then after that, we need to open up the mirror itself. So there's a secondary mirror on a boom that opens up. And then the primary mirror is made up of 18 different segments. And there are two little wings that can open up to, to make the primary mirror whole, essentially. And each of those 18 segments can be moved individually to focus the mirror very well. So the deployment in total takes about took about 14 days, and then it took about 30 days to get it to its final destination at L2. So we have never done something like this. We were calling this the 14 days of terror because we were very, very nervous that something was gonna go awry, but nothing, nothing wrong, nothing bad happened. So it was really, really amazing. And we were very happy. Um, if you're interested, NASA had a lot of footage uh, even showing the live action going on in the at mission control and sending the commands to deploy different things on the telescope. So you can, you can look at that online if you're interested. So we didn't send this telescope out around the earth in low earth orbit. We sent it at a point called L2. So if you're taking the gravitational system of the earth and, and um, the sun, there are certain points in this system where the gravitational forces of both celestial bodies are in perfect equilibrium. They're sort of like interesting little parking spots. They're called Lagrange points. And you can stay near those spots with relatively little amounts of fuel. And fuel is often the limiting factor to the mission lifetime of a telescope. And so we wanted to, you know, save up as much fuel as possible to have as long of a mission as possible. So we sent it at L2. So it's orbiting an empty point in space called L2, and it doesn't need a lot of fuel to stay there. And so we needed to send it there because of the type of light this telescope is looking at, infrared light. So let's compare this telescope to Hubble because it's the one that we talk about the most. It's quite a bit bigger than Hubble. Hubble, I mentioned, is sort of like a big human eyeball looking at visible light, a little bit of ultraviolet and a little bit of infrared, but almost nothing. And it has a, a mirror that's 2.4 meters wide. So when I say that like Webb is a lot bigger, like don't get me wrong, Hubble is big. Hubble is about as big as a school bus. But Webb, I mentioned the biggest component, the sun shield is as big as a tennis court. So it's even bigger. Its mirror is also bigger, 6.5 meters. And if you look at the area of that, rather than just the width, that's about six to seven times bigger, which means six to seven times better at capturing light. So it can see things that are much dimmer, 
much less bright. And it's looking at infrared light. And that's one of the reasons why its mirror is coated in gold, whereas visible mirrors, visible telescopes tend to be more coated in aluminum. Aluminum reflects visible light very effectively. Gold is much more effective at reflecting infrared light. So you end up with a beautiful golden mirror. Uh, I mentioned the sun shield a little bit, and I mentioned that there's a hot side and a cold side. So this is really essential because infrared light is often very associated with heat. So if sunlight were to hit the mirror and the instruments on the telescope, they would heat up themselves, start radiating in the infrared light and cause their own light pollution, essentially. So the sun shield makes sure that that doesn't happen. So the solar panels, the communications array, they're on the hot side. And when I mean hot, I, I, I mean 85 degrees Celsius, so, so quite hot, uncomfortably hot for us. And on the cold side, it's cooled down to minus 233 degrees Celsius. And if you know Kelvin, that's only about 40 degrees above absolute zero. So very, very cold to make sure that there is no light pollution caused by the heating of these instruments. So I'm talking a lot about infrared light right now, but like, why are we interested in infrared light? So I mentioned at the start that lots of different things radiate and lots of different kinds of light in the universe. So we're interested in all of them. But infrared is especially interesting if you want to look at very, very distant objects, such as galaxies. So this is a nice connection here with Doppler shift if you're doing that in upper high school um, years. So you may be familiar with Doppler shift. We often talk about it when we're talking about ambulances. Essentially, if you have something emitting sound that is approaching you, the sound waves get compressed, the pitch gets higher. But if the object is going away from you, the sound waves are elongated and the, the pitch goes lower. So the pitch changes depending on the direction that the, the sound emitting object is uh, coming towards you or, or away from you. The same kind of concept happens with light because lights are just waves, just like sound waves. So in when you're talking about light, this is something called redshift. And so imagine you have a spaceship that's emitting light like a siren. And as it's coming towards you, those light waves are compressed. So if you're looking at your electromagnetic spectrum, shorter wavelengths, if you're looking at the colors of the rainbow, are bluer. But if the spaceship is going away from you, that light is stretched. And when light is stretched, those are longer wavelengths. That is red light. So this is why we call it redshift, because objects in space tend to expand away from you, and so they become redder. So this is what happens with galaxies. We live in a universe that is expanding, and the objects that are very, very old and very far away from us expand and go away from us even faster. So when a galaxy is moving away from you, the light that it's shining at is actually being stretched to, to redder wavelengths. And the very first galaxies ever created right after the Big Bang were very bright in the blue and ultraviolet light. But because they're so far away, that light has stretched all the way into the infrared light. So that is why we're interested in looking at infrared, especially when we're thinking of galaxies. There are lots of different reasons, other reasons though, to look at infrared. So this is an image taken by the Hubble telescope called um, the Pillars of Creation in the Eagle Nebula. And uh, there's lots of dust, stars being born in this area, but lots of dust, cosmic dust that's blocking visible light. One thing that's great about infrared light, however, is that it pierces through cosmic dust. So looking at exactly the same part of the sky in infrared light this time, we can actually see through that veil of dust and we see tons more stars. So looking at infrared light gives you a new window on the universe and you don't have to look far at very far away galaxies, even just close by in our own Milky Way, it opens up a new window to what's going on in the universe. So a few words on the scientific instruments now on web. So this is on the cold side, as I mentioned, and this is, I can show you right here. This is a little model of the telescope. The mirror is right here. This is what you can see on the diagram. This is called the instrument module, the integrated instrument, sci integrated in scientific instrument module or ISOM. And in here are all of the instruments that are going to be used for web, by, by web to do science. And inside we have four instruments. And in the very center, you have the Canadian instrument, which is a double instrument called FGS 
and nearest. You also have near spec, near cam, and miri. And all these instruments are combinations of cameras and spectrographs, which are sort of like glass prisms that like if you shine light through it you diffract into the whole rainbow except a little bit more complicated than that but the essentially they do the same thing they diffract light so that you can study dissect different colors of the infrared in 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 the light so they're all in the back of the mirror there and uh, the canadian instrument the contribution that canada gave is a double instrument as i mentioned you can see a picture here as it's being tested this is about the size of a washing machine and on top, you have the FGS, the fine guidance sensor. This is not a scientific instrument. It is, however, a mission critical piece of the telescope. This is essentially what allows the telescope to point at a specific target and stay fixed to it in a very precise and stable way. As the telescope is orbiting that point L2 that I mentioned before, it's vibrating a little bit, it's moving. It's sort of like trying to take a picture of a something with a camera while you're sort of like shaking it around. It's not ideal, you get a blurry image, but the fine guidance sensor allows the mirrors to sort of deform very, very rapidly, 16 times per second, in order for the image to counteract that vibration and be very nice and crisp and clear. And it is the most precise Biden guidance sensor on a telescope that has ever been built. Its precision is the equivalent of being able to see someone wink at you from Toronto if you're in Montreal. It's, it's a very, very precise instrument. And it is mission critical, as I mentioned. So even though it is not a scientific instrument, every single picture and piece of data that you will see or hear about coming from Webb will be facilitated by these Canadian eyes on Webb. On the underside here, you have the scientific instrument called NIRIS, or the Near Infrared Imager and Slipless Spectrograph. And it is a combination of a camera and a prism, as I mentioned before, and it will be able to do lots of different things, special focus on exoplanets, which I'll mention in a moment, and very early galaxies. So this is what we gave. Canada gave this. It cost about $200 million over a few decades, uh, about 25 cents per Canadian per year, so a pretty good deal. What do we get in return for this contribution? Well, Canadians get to use time on the telescope to do our science. So at least 5% of the time, the observing time on the telescope will be given to Canada. So there are different types of programs. I can mention two programs here. One is called Guaranteed Time Observations, and this is directly given to the scientific team that built the instrument, the Canadian instrument on web. So this is 450 hours in the first year, year and a half of the telescope's operations, including two very big programs. One is called NEAT, led by the University of Montreal, to look at the composition of the atmospheres of exoplanets. The other one is called Canucks led by the National Research Council uh, in Victoria. And this is going to be looking at very, very distant and early galaxies. The other type of program is on a competitive basis. Every year, astronomers from all over the world write up a proposal saying, this is what I want to do. This is why my proposal is the best. Please give me time on the telescope. And then it's submitted to a committee who then select the, the best proposals. And so the first year of observations for this program has already been mapped out and 14 proposals led by Canadians for a total of 331 hours has been given. And we have 72 more proposals with Canadian collaborators on it because Canadians like to collaborate. But that means that 14 Canadians will lead projects um, using some of the very first images coming off of the Webb telescope. So in terms of scientific missions, what will Webb be interested in? There are four categories that I can mention. Alien worlds the life cycle of stars, galaxies through time, and the early universe. So we'll briefly go through these different subjects. So for alien worlds, we can talk about worlds that are outside of our solar system. Uh, exoplanets, this is what we call them. And uh, if you want to know more about exoplanets, look at all of the, the content that my institute, IREX, um, has created for them. So there's lots of really good content for your classrooms as well. And I mentioned the NEAT program. This is one of the things that it's going to be doing, looking at these exoplanets. So if you know a little bit about exoplanets, you might know that it's very hard to observe them directly. Most of the time, we only observe them when they pass in front of their star that they're orbiting, and we notice the star gets dimmer 
for a moment, periodically. And the more dim it goes, the closer to its star the planet is or the bigger the planet is. So we can find out lots of information just by looking at this periodic dimming of the light of the star. But what is blocking out the light of the star is the solid part of the exoplanet. There, if we get lucky, some of these exoplanets have an atmosphere just like the Earth. And just like I mentioned that the atmosphere around the Earth is blocking certain things, well, certain molecules will block out certain types of light in the atmospheres of these exoplanets too. So if an exoplanet with an atmosphere passes in front of a star, the starlight will be blocked out by the solid part, the rocky part of the exoplanet, but it will stream through the translucent atmosphere. And as it streams through, certain atoms and molecules will absorb certain colors or certain types of light. This is called transit spectroscopy. And Webb and its instruments will be able to look at the signature. It's like a barcode, essentially, that tells us what molecules are inside the atmosphere of these exoplanets. And we can essentially look at this and figure out, is there water vapor? Is there oxygen, carbon dioxide, ozone, methane? And different ratios and combinations of these molecules could lead us to believe that these worlds are habitable or maybe even inhabited. We are looking for biosignatures or signs of alien life. And the TRAPPIST-1 system is some of the very first worlds that we will be looking at with this strategy. Uh, and when I mean life, I don't mean little green men, more on the order of, you know, bacteria, microbes, very, very simple life. We also have alien worlds within our own solar system, however, uh, and I can give as an example this world called Enceladus, which is a moon orbiting around the planet Saturn. And so it's an ice moon about 500 kilometers across, quite small, and um, we think underneath its crust of ice, there might be a liquid ocean. How to probe this liquid ocean? Luckily, there are ice volcanoes or cryovolcanoes on the surface of this moon that ejects out liquid from that ocean. So in a similar method as transit spectroscopy for exoplanets, as light streams through these jets of water, the molecules inside that water, if there are any interesting molecules, will absorb types of light. And so Webb will be able to tell us what exactly is inside this alien world's ocean. So lots of different things we can do inside and outside of our solar system. And so these are just a few of the astronomers who will be leading programs in the first few years on web looking at these alien worlds. So it could be exoplanets, rogue planets that no longer orbit a star, solar systems that are being born, brown dwarfs, which are odd objects that are sort of in between big planets and very small stars, or trans-Neptunian objects, which are sort of akin to Pluto and all the sort of like rocks that are hanging out out there very, very far in the solar system. Now, moving on to the next point, the stellar life cycle, we're interested in looking at stars across their entire lives. So from the moment they're born, and that can be here in stellar nurseries like the Orion Nebula, um, as they're being formed, this is a, a solar system that's being formed. So there's a star that's being blocked out. This is a disk of dust that's sort of agglomerating into a baby planet here. So we can actually take images of this happening with Webb up to the death of these stars. So black holes, white dwarfs, neutron stars, lots of interesting things. And uh, these are a few more Canadians that can do that kind of science. So it can go from the very birth of these stars to the death of these stars and how these stars affect their environments, how they affect the galaxies that they inhabit as well. And uh, I can also mention galaxies, how galaxies form and evolve. This is a very interesting topic, uh, especially in Canada with the Canucks program that's being led by Chris Willett that we can see here. Lots of different things we can do with galaxies. We can take breathtaking images of galaxies, of course, um, study how they evolve, study how the supermassive black hole, which we think is at the center of most galaxies, how that affects the evolution of its host galaxy. But one thing that Webb is really hoping to do is study the very first galaxies born only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And I can show you here an animation uh, a 3D rendering of a very famous image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope called the the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So it was taken in a relatively blank part of the sky, as far as we knew. It, they kept the, the camera open for a very long period of time to capture as much light as possible. And in that one picture, and there are a few iterations of this picture, we discovered 
lots and lots of galaxies that we had never been able to see before without a tool like Hubble. So we're sort of moving through this picture because we can measure the distance to these galaxies. So this is something that we really, really, it, it, it blew our conception of the universe and made us realize that there's a lot out there that we don't know that we haven't seen before. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's like at least a trillion galaxies in our universe right now, many of which we haven't been able to see yet. So this is a Hubble ultra deep field, but we're hoping that Webb will be able to do it one better. So this is a simulation here of what we think Webb will be able to do. So this is a picture taken from the Hubble ultra deep field, a close up of one specific galaxy that's a little bit closer. And below is a simulation of what we think Webb will be able to see in the same spot. So first of all, the galaxy that's closer, we can see more details. We can see little knots of star formation peppered throughout. But the important thing is that we can see lots of extra reddish galaxies in the background that were invisible to Hubble because Hubble couldn't look at the infrared. And because these galaxies are so far away and so redshifted, they are only visible in the infrared to a telescope like Webb. So this ties in with the last scientific theme, which is the early universe. So Hubble was a huge breakthrough. It managed to get us to about 500 million years after the Big Bang. We think Webb will be able to push us to about 200 million years after the Big Bang. Now that sounds like a lot, 200 million years, that's like a long time. But if you took the entire history of the universe, 13.7 billion years, and you put it on a calendar year, and you put us, modern time, at just before New Year's, December 31st, right before midnight, Webb is the equivalent of being able to see all the way back to January 6th of that same year. So you can see really, really far back. And so we're hoping to look at the very first structures that are being formed in the early universe with Webb. So here I have a series of resources. I'm going to give these, this, this PDF to Julie so she can share with you. Lots of different content online that you can use for um, your classes or for yourself pertaining to web and astronomy in general. If you're interested in doing citizen science or you would like to involve your students in citizen science, there are some links there. And we are always happy to visit your classrooms if you're interested. Right now they're virtual visits, but uh, you can invite an IRX astronomer into your classroom, including myself. So I'm gonna leave all of that to you. And uh, yeah, I hope I've made you excited for this mission. It's launched now finally, but it's only just starting and uh, we're very, very excited for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathalie. This was, again, super interesting and fascinating. I love the telescope, James, uh, the James Webb telescope, actually. I've, I've known about it for many years and I always find it interesting to learn more. Um, as people write their questions in the chats, again, if you're live with us, feel free to send your questions to Nathalie. I remembered what I forgot to say early on at the beginning of the webinar. I forgot to mention what Discover the Universe is. So if you are new to Discover the Universe, uh, we're there to help you in your astronomy teaching. So our main target audience in a sense are K-12 uh, uh, teachers across Canada, but all kinds of educators. If you work with your groups, then we're happy to for you to use our content, uh, come to our webinars and use our resources to help bring the wonders of the universe to your students and to kids. Uh, so if you are not um, subscribed uh, to our newsletter yet, I invite you to do so, so you'll be able to learn about our next activities and new resources. Um, so yes, that's what I was supposed to say early on, but I just did. So as um, we're giving a few minutes for people to write their questions, again, don't be shy if you have some, this is your chance to ask Nathalie. Nathalie, there's a question. I don't think you've mentioned it. So when can we expect the first pictures? I think that's always interesting for people to, uh, to know. Yeah, so I can mention the next few steps. So uh, the, the Webb telescope is at L2 now, and we've just started what we call commissioning. So last Friday, all the tele all the instruments turned on, which was very exciting. I was I, I was looped into the operation center essentially, and we could hear people turning on the Canadian instrument. It all went really well. Um, and so the next few months, we need to align the telescope to a very precise degree so that it can focus and take beautiful images. Uh, it still needs to cool down further to its operating temperature of minus 233 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then we test all of the telescope's instruments, make sure everything works. So that's going to be uh, take about another five or so months. And the very first images to be released, we can expect them in, in the summer. So like 
July thereabouts. Uh, and uh, after those five months in July, science starts. So we start collecting scientific data and disseminating to all the people who, who are getting time on web. Awesome. And yes, I see some questions. Actually, feel free to send your questions to everyone. Actually, many of them are coming just to the host and panelists. But um, yes, you will get a copy of Nathalie's uh, set of slides in PDF because the PowerPoint is way too big a file with all the animations, but it will send you the link. So you'll get the PDF and you'll get the links to the main uh, videos or animations she showed. Um, so I will send that to all everyone who registered for this webinar um, with the link to the recording. So if you want to watch some parts again, uh, that will come probably tomorrow. Yeah, I'll send that tomorrow. Are there more questions about James Webb? Okay, so an athletic question came in uh, about the halo orbit looks perpendicular to Earth's orbit. Yeah, so no downtime caused by eclipses by Earth or Moon. Yes, people like that question. Let me just get back to the the part that shows that. Um, all right, I'm going to share it like this just because the Zoom stuff is like blocking my view otherwise. <laughs> but you can still see the animation. All right, there you go. Yeah, that's right. So it's actually a, it, it's a, sort of like on a plane that is a perpendicular to the line of sight between the earth and the sun and L2. And it is a big radius. It's about half a million kilometers uh, in, in radius around. It takes about six months to complete uh, one orbit around that point. And so you don't have any eclipses with the earth or the moon. Uh, and one of the reasons is because it's solar powered, so that would be bad news if we lost our solar power uh, due to an eclipse. So there's no issues with uh, with that. Um, I'll just give you another minute or so for questions. I was gonna ask something for some reason. I then I seem to be forgetting everything I want to say tonight. Uh, Oh, yes. No, I remember that. I remember that last week in French. So yes, actually, if you are interested in hearing this webinar in French, or would like to have the, the resources in French, uh, we do have that as well. Just email me, email someone at Discover the Universe on the website that will come to me, and I can give that information. But when this discussion we had was, okay, you talked about the science programs, like things we can expect a bit or sort of what, what we want to do with the telescope. But we, I love the discussion of maybe the best discoveries uh, are from things we're not expecting at all, right? So you want to say a bit how like it might completely change our views of like many things about the universe just because we don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, so one thing I can mention that I always find really interesting is that Hubble actually made incredible discoveries about uh, the atmospheres of certain exoplanets. But when Hubble was created, conceived and launched, um, the first exoplanet hadn't even been detected. Like it's been centuries that we think theoretically these things might exist, but Hubble was never built to actually look at exoplanets. And yet it still made amazing discoveries in that realm. Now, Webb, exoplanets have been considered in the development of its instruments. So it's gonna like be mind blowing what it can actually do in terms of exoplanet discoveries because it was actually built to study them. But there will probably be some equivalent of something that like we haven't even thought of that wasn't incorporated in the design of the instruments while it was being built. And it's gonna make this incredible discovery that we didn't even expect. And that always ends up happening with these missions. It's really, really amazing. And so, yeah, there, there's probably, the, one of the greatest discoveries of Webb is probably a answer to a question we haven't even asked yet. Yeah, I find that fascinating. Um, okay, lots of questions coming in now. I, I do like the question about your necklace, Natalie. And this is something actually I find fascinating with Webb. It's just like the, the mirror is becoming an icon in itself, just the like golden in the shape of it. So yeah. yes, uh, there was a question about where can we get a necklace like yours or, you know, there are many things with um, the, the Webb telescope now, the, the mirror itself, which is, I find fascinating. Yeah, so for, for this, um, it's a boutique and the boutique doesn't exist anymore, but they have a deal through an online website called Startorialist. 
and uh, they have lots of deals with different um, independent artists and, and jewelry makers who make uh, essentially astronomy and science themed stuff. If you are in Montreal, they also have a deal with the planetarium. So they sell a lot of their swag over there. So you can just pop in and then, yeah, grab a necklace. Pretty neat. Okay, lots of questions. Uh, do you want to pick one? I don't know if we'll have time to answer all of them. And sure. Maybe um, you read it and answer it yourself. Yeah, so what ground station is the data received here on Earth? So as is the case with a lot of NASA missions, it's the Deep Space Network. Uh, it's three separate um, telescopes and dishes in Spain, Australia, and California. And uh, that means that no matter where, you know, what time of day it is, there's one of those dishes that's pointing towards deep space. And so, you know, we're talking web, all of the other space telescopes, Voyager still uses it. Like a lot of stuff is talking to the deep space network. Um, how is solar power used to keep the telescope in its orbit? It is not. Uh, that is actually one of the things that is not solar powered. It is fueled by, um, uh, essentially, it's, there's a fuel and that is for a long time, that was a concern with the mission lifetime. So every three weeks or so, the telescope uses its fuel and its little thrusters to adjust its orbit, to keep it in orbit around L2. But because it's L2, it doesn't need to work so hard and use up as much fuel. I know that time is running out. I'm happy to stay to answer the other ones. Yeah, actually, maybe one last one, which I think is very interesting. Will James Webb look at any uh, targets in our solar system? Yeah, so everything that is from the er orbit of Mars onwards is fair game. And uh, there's lots of plans to do it because it can't flip around in such a way that like it, you know, this is this is the sun. It needs to stay protected from the sun. It can't just like, hey, I'm going to look over there now because like it's going to fry all of that stuff. So Mercury, Venus, well, the sun, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and the moon, we can't look at them. But everything else that's outwards so Mars, all the gas planets, Pluto, all that kind of stuff. We can look at that. Awesome. So yes, there are a few more questions. So maybe we'll uh, finish the webinar officially now and we can do a few of them right after in the next few minutes for those of you who are live with us. So I would like to thank uh, everyone who's participated live with us and who watched the recording. So thank you very much for staying till the end. And of course, Thank you, Nathalie, for coming with us and sharing your knowledge of the Web Space Telescope with us. It's always a pleasure. Okay, so thanks, everyone. And we'll see you hopefully uh, in our next webinar.